Very excited to be um, looking into new research projects um, at the Jeffrey Jefferson Brain Research Centre. Um, we are looking, we're going to learn today about adoptive cell therapy with tumour infiltrating lymphocytes for NF2. So um, if you didn't understand what that meant, that's what this next hour is all about, really. So we want to explain to you this type of novel immunotherapy, how it works, um, how, where it works at the moment um, for other conditions, and then how it could possibly work for NF2. And um, we want to fundraise for this particular project. So my name is Claire Goddard, and I'm I run the um, the NF2 Bio Solutions UK arm of NF2 Bio Solutions. Uh, so we're a registered charity in the UK, and um, we were launched in 2019. My husband and two children have NF2, and um, we've had various operations. Um, you know big ones, we have deafness, we have mobility problems in the family, and um, we are keen to be looking at absolutely everything to help people with NF2. So um, we've got a fantastic panel here today. I'll just pass over, first of all, to um, Jill Aitlin, that you'll, you'll all know, Vice President for NF2 Biosolutions. So Jill, Jill, can we have a quick word from you, please? Yes, sure, thank you. Thank you to everyone that are joining today, and uh, the android of View your future viewer that are going to watch the recording on YouTube and Facebook. So my name is Gil Atlan. I'm the VP of NF2 Biosolution U uh, USA. My daughter Karen, she is 14 years old and she was born with NF2. We diagnosed her when she was six years old due to a cataract. And uh, since then she had two eye surgery. We removed also one vestibular schwannoma. Uh, the surgery went well. She's still okay, but. As you know, like most of the NF2 patients, she has many more tumors in her body, schwannoma, meningiomas, and epididymoma. So as you can imagine, that's, uh, she's the reason why I fight with you, with all of you today, to find a long-term therapy for NF2. And uh, I would like to spend a, a minute or two just to explain you why we at NF2 Biosolution, why we jumpstart and sponsor many different approaches in parallel. We jump started and support gene therapy that includes several approaches like gene addition at Nationwide Columbus, gene replacement at UMass Boston, suicide gene at Harvard Medical School. We support also a type of immunotherapy using bacteria at Harvard Medical School. And we also started NF2 cell line and tissue bank at CHOP uh, in USA and many more other research projects. But you might ask yourself why we don't finance only one approach, putting all the resources and all the money into one in order to go faster. So there is several reasons why. The first reason is that we don't know what is going to work at the end. We don't know how it is going to work and we don't know for who it is going to work. We don't want to put all our eggs in the same basket and end up with nothing. The second reason is that there is different approaches that have different goals and might have also different patient targets as well. Some have the goal of destroying existing tumor, some have the goal of stopping the growth of existing tumor, and some might have uh, the goal of avoiding new tumor to emerge. And the third reason is that by having more labs and researching, researchers working in parallel on different approach, it creates a dynamic that is attracting more and more researchers and biotechs to join the fight. So thanks to all of you, we are definitely not today putting NF2 on the map of the top researchers in, in the world. And uh, today, Dr. O'Leary and her team will present to you a new approach that is successfully used in ovarian cancer. Uh, to be able to start this project, we need your donations and your support. The link for donating uh, is on our Facebook page. It is on our website as well. And it is also here in the chat. Uh, there will be a link that Rebecca is going to post or is already posted and you can just click and donate. So thank you again. And only with your, your support, we will prevail. And I give you back the mic, uh, Claire. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. So it'd be great to introduce our panel now. Uh, perhaps you can just go around the room and you can introduce yourselves. It might be really nice. So Omar, um, could we start with you, please, Omar Patmanaban? Uh, thank, thanks, Claire. I, I'm Omar Patmanaban. I'm uh, a neurosurgeon and researcher in, in NF2 in Manchester. Um, we've got a very long established and large NF2 
practice in Manchester. And so we see on a daily basis the need for better treatments and, and new things to make what we can do for our patients better. So uh, so that's, uh, and I work with, with Claire and Gahal, who are both here as well, who introduce themselves next. Claire? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Claire O'Leary and I'm a postdoc and I'm based at the University of Manchester and I've been working, I started working on advanced therapies, so cell and gene based therapies in 2012 and I joined the surgical neuro-oncology lab out um, in the Jeffrey Jefferson in 2019 and I work with Cahal and Omar. Thanks Claire. Yeah. Hi, yeah, I'm uh, I'm Cahal Hannan. I'm one of the neurosurgery research registrars and uh, neurosurgical trainees and um, working at the University of Manchester. And then um, my role in this project would be primarily be in the identification of patients that were suitable um, for uh, for enrollment into any studies looking into the um, looking at the TIL therapy in NF2 um, and uh, with respect. Uh, and I, sorry. Yeah, and my role will be for identifying the patients that would be suitable for enrollment into the uh, into the study. Um, and this would be a study that would be identifying a treatment that's applicable for vestibular schwannomas and meningiomas and ependymomas primarily. Fantastic, thank you. So we'll probably abbreviate tumour infiltrating lymphocytes to TEAL for this um, purpose so that people can keep up. <laughs> Um, and that's for my benefit too. Um, so Claire, we'll kick off. Um, please tell us, you know, on a very basic level, what is immunotherapy and how does it work? So um, the way to think of immunotherapy, just to make it clear, is that we need to think of like, we think of the immune system. So we think of it like an army. So this army is constantly patrolling the body and it's making sure that anything can, that harm it can be destroyed. So immunotherapy, it's a treatment that can strengthen the natural ability of the cells in the immune system to fight cancer. So instead of targeting the person's cancer cells directly, immunotherapy, it, can tra it trains these cells to recognize cancer cells more effectively to target and kill them. So there's a few different approaches, but I will speak about that later on. Oh, fantastic. OK, so, so what's a tumor antigen and do the different NF tumors share common antigens? So healthy cells, they display normal proteins on their surface. And the immune system, it's learned to ignore normal proteins. So, but if surface proteins are abnormal, so like when you get a virus, when a virus infects a cell or when the cell becomes cancerous, these can be recognized by the immune system. So these proteins that are recognized by the immune system, we call them antigens. Um, at the moment, we actually don't have any data that will let us know if the different NF2 tumours share common antigens, but this is something we'd be very interested in looking at in further experimental work. Okay, fantastic. So you mentioned um, in immunotherapy to treat cancers. Mm -hmm. um, what different kinds of immunotherapy are out there at the moment um, to treat cancers? So there's four main types at the moment. So one you have heard a lot about are checkpoint inhibitors. There's adoptive cell transfer, cytokines and vaccines. So a checkpoint inhibitor, and um, I'll just go through that. So T cells, they have proteins on them and these proteins, they can switch the immune system on and off. And these are called checkpoint proteins. So these checkpoint proteins, they can turn off T cells when they should really be attacking cancer cells. So drugs, the block these checkpoint proteins, they're called checkpoint inhibitors, and they can switch these T cells back on so they can find and attack the cancer cells. The next approach is adoptive cell transfer. And this is when a treatment that attempts to boost the natural ability of your T cells to fight cancer. So T cells, they're taken from, your from the tumor or from a blood sample. And the T cells that are most active against the cancers, they're isolated or can be gene modified to make them better able to find and destroy your cancer cells. Another approach is cytokines, and these are proteins that are made by your body cells. They have an important role in your body's normal immune response and also in the immune system's ability to respond to cancer. And the two main types of cytokines that are used to treat cancer, they're known as interferons and interleukins. 
And finally, there's a vac vaccines. So these treatment vaccines, so they're different to the vaccines that you would have had to pre help prevent disease. These work by boosting your immune system's response to cancer. So that's, that's them in a nutshell. That's a big nut. <laughs> <laughs> very well explained. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, so we're going to use this word infiltrating, tumour infiltrating lymphocytes, teal. So, um, so, so the teals, how will this immunothera immunotherapy work for people with NF2? Yeah, I just have a slide now that just might make this a bit clear. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Perfect. So lymphocytes um, or white blood cells, so they're an important part of this immune of your, your immune system. So these cells that are constantly patrolling your body, fight, you know, looking for things to destroy, basically. Um, and the, so helping to fight off infections or eliminate disease cells. So lymphocytes, so they're made up mainly of T cells. They contain some B cells and another type of cell called natural killer cells. And um, so, and these are constantly patrolling the body just to make sure, just to identify cells that are present, including cancer. So as cancers grow, lymphocytes, they can recognize these cells as being abnormal and penetrate into the tumor and kill cancer cells. And these are what we call a tumor infiltrating lymphocyte or a TIL. So this, so the slide is just a diagram of the approach that we'll take for, for patients with NF2 um, so this is just a little schematic. So what happens is there, um, we'll take a tumor biopsy. From this tumor biopsy, we'll isolate some T cells and grow them in the lab. So in growing them in the lab, we're going to increase their number. Then we can deliver high numbers of T cells back into the patient. These T cells then can recognize and kill cancer cells. And what we hope to achieve is by increasing the number of T cells that they mount a stronger response to the tumours compared to the attack that might occur naturally. So Claire, sorry, uh, just, mm -hmm. just a question about that. So you, you mean you take a biopsy from one tumour, let's say a, a tumour that is very easy to access from an NF2 patient, often an NF2 patient has external uh, peripheral tumour. So we, we extract the biopsy from it then grow the cells, re-inject, but then it might attack all the other tumor, correct? Even the one, the vestibular schwannoma tumor or meningioma in theory, so correct? It, do, it does have the potential, but we don't know yet. The TILs, they, they usually work better when you have these, a type of T cell, that's a, what we call it, it's a CD8 positive T cell. And when these are highly expressed in tumor types, the TIL therapy works better and these, these they basically can home to that. And we do know that NF2 meningiomas and schwannomas actually have high levels of this expression. And ependymomas, there's been some, it, very less, not as much data, but there is some single cell or RNA sequencing data that does suggest that these cells are also present. But at the moment, we, can, we, we don't know if it's a possibility, but we would need to do the experiments. Yeah, that's why we have to try. Okay, so what's the difference between TILs and um, CAR-T? Yeah, so I have another slide, just to make it a bit easier. So um, as I previously mentioned, so TILs, they're your body's own cells, and they're grown in high numbers and then reinfused back into the patients. So because TILs, they come directly from the patient, they already recognize many targets on cancer cells, so we don't actually have to do anything to them to point them towards the tumor. So CAR T's are different. So this is a more targeted approach. And with a CAR T, you actually change the T cells. So you might hear this is called a genetically engineering of the T cells. And this is when they insert something called the CAR gene. So this CAR gene, and that stands for a chimeric antigen receptor. So once that's inserted, your T cell is now what we call a CAR T cell, and that can be transplanted back into the patient. And these CAR T cells because they have this now, this um, antigen receptor, they have the ability to recognize and target specific proteins on cancer cells. So that's the main difference. Okay, thank you. Um, Carl, I've got a question for you. Um, 
what we're discussing here is it safe that's you know a big question is it safe and um are there any patients that aren't suitable for it yeah so that's a that's a great question and any medication that we take unfortunately has some side effects and um, even right down to the paracetamol that we would take for a headache and the main side effects that are associated with this type of therapy is there's underactivation of the immune system and overactivation of the immune system. So um, Claire, I'll come on to this a bit later on, but in preparation to have this medication, we need to give um, a very short course of um, medications that will turn down the body's natural T-cell response just briefly. And as a result of that, that means that patients are susceptible to infections and low levels of platelets, which are the clotting cells in the blood. Um, but that's something that we would keep an eye on at the time of the treatment. Um, and it's usually something that we're, we're very used to dealing with. And the second thing is that we give these, tees, uh, we give these tills as a, in an effort to boost the body's immune response um, against the tumor cells. Um, but unfortunately, that can sometimes lead to the body's immune response becoming overactive. Um, and again, that's something that we can manage with medication if it were to happen. Um, and the majority of patients are eligible to receive treatment like this, but patients who have coexisting autoimmune conditions would be the main group of patients who unfortunately wouldn't be able to, um, because we it would be more difficult to predict how the patients would respond to that treatment, um, given that this is based around the immune system. So those are the main side effects, and then the, the main group of patients that unfortunately wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be suitable for this. Yeah, okay, well explained, thank you. Um, Claire, I think we were going to ask the audience their opinion on a poll, weren't we? Because this is um, such a fascinating subject, really, about whether we think the immune system can help ourselves. Um, did you want to ask people to participate in your poll now? Yeah. So um, so the, the, the question that, that we're interested in is, how do you feel about the use of a patient's own immune system to treat NF2? So we have three options, whether you agree you disagree or if you're unsure. So just it should have popped up on your screen now. If you can please take a couple of seconds um, just to fill that in and then we can get the results quite quickly there. OK, um, so Claire, back to, back to you again. Um, is TIL used today as a therapy for other tumours and disorders? So currently, um, TIL therapy is available through clinical trials. There's no actual approved ter therapy as of yet. Um, in the last 10 years, though, there has been approximately 70 trials of, of TILs. Um, these are mainly from, so melanoma is the, the one that's been most extensively used. Um, and there's ovarian cancer, um, cervical cancer, head and neck cancer, and non-small lung cell cancer. And they all... Um, have you know quite promising results okay thank you i've just seen the results flash up there very high percentage 81 uh, percent of people on this webinar agree um with that with your poll statement there claire so that's um a great response um right so uh, this uh i think perhaps for carl um what will happen to the tumors um during this therapy do they shrink or do they stop growing? Can you explain a bit more about um, results? Sure, yeah. So the, the results have been mixed um, in melanoma in particular. So there are some patients who will have all of their tumor burden that will completely disappear um, in that the immune system has stopped it from, uh, stopped from growing and killed the cells that were there initially. Um, but there's also people who had um, melanoma and had what are called metastases. So tumors that have spread to other areas of the body and they were growing despite the best treatment that these patients could have had beforehand. And when they, when they had the, um, when they had the TIL therapy, then that was able to stop the metastases from growing any further. And that's something that has been sustained over a number of years, not just something that occurred over a month or two, that's something that sustained over a number of years. And it's interesting because I'm sure that a lot of people on the call have heard about Avastin and the Bevacizumab, which is the drug that we use to treat schwannomas associated with um, NF2. And, even though there are some patients whose tumors, they don't shrink, um, but they do stop growing. There are some patients who will notice an improvement in their hearing, even when, uh, even when the tumors have, uh, have not shrunken um, and that, they, that, that they've stopped growing. So either response would be, would be positive, I think it's fair to say. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, so we've spoken about the different types of tumours in NF2, um, meningiomas, ependymomas, and the vestibular schwannomas. Um, would a different approach be needed for those different tumour types, um, Claire? Um, so we anticipate that you would use a similar approach for, we'll say, both meningioma and schwannoma. Um, ependymomas might be slightly different, but I think when we start the study, we might have a better idea of how to approach it. Um, I'm not sure if anyone else wants to chip in. Yeah, I, th I think the, the, the biggest difference, I suppose, there is that both schwannomas and meningiomas exist outside the blood-brain barrier. This natural defense that exists between the blood and, and the brain or spinal cord. Um, whereas uh, ependymomas have a different relationship there. And so, so we would have to um, see. And I think the other thing about it is that many patients with ependymomas don't uh, have surgery in the same numbers as patients with schwannomas and meningiomas. Uh, and as a result, the numbers of patients with tumours that would be eligible to take part in early studies is likely to be smaller. And so accrual of that information on whether it works just will take longer. Thank you. Um, Claire, do you have any data on success rates of this type of therapy you can share with us? So it's, it's very effective in, so mo the most data is available for melanoma, and that has been shown to have um, objective response rates of up to 50% and durable complete response rates of about 20% in melanoma patients. And these response rates are ongoing. They said it's between 64 to 109 months after follow-up. Okay, thank you. Um, Carl, over to you. Um, is immunotherapy a long-term solution for NF2? So um, in that, you know, how long can a person be on it? Is it something that we can expect a patient to use and then they can, you know, they'll see results or do they need to be on it long term? Can you just explain a bit more around that, please? Yeah, sure. That, that's an interesting question. So again, most of the most of the data to answer that question comes from melanoma because that's the the tumor type that um, immunotherapy has been in use for the longest. Um, and what they find is that they typically have patients on immunotherapy for roughly two years. But even after the treatment has stopped, so for a long time after the treatment has stopped, two to three years, there are patients who will have continued to have a sustained response because there's a concept of the immune system being retrained. So it's not, it's not like Claire explained at the start, these aren't cancer drugs in the traditional sense whereby we give a drug that is toxic to the tumor cells. What we're doing is trying to train the immune system to recognize the tumor cells and to be able to fight it of its own accord, really, with a bit of a prompting from the drug rather than the drug being directly toxic against the cells themselves. And there, there was some interesting work done in sporadic vestibular schwannoma. So a patient who had a sporadic vestibular schwannoma and not associated with NF2, but we know that these tumor types are very similar, where they gave immunotherapy to a patient who had, uh, who had a vestibular schwannoma that was resistant to surgery and radiotherapy. And even after 18 months of treatment, more than two years beyond that, the tumor has remained, remained stable and hasn't required any further treatment. So it's just a, it's a bit different to how we would traditionally understand medication insofar as we would expect a sustained response after we stop the drugs. Okay, so can a patient take medication alongside immunotherapy successfully? Uh, yeah, there's no, there's no reason why not. Obviously, there are certain medications where there are patients there um, where we don't like it because it can interact with immunotherapy. And the one that most, um, that springs to mind most easily, there are steroids. So Often when patients are on steroids, that can, um, that can affect the body's immune response. And we try and avoid patients being on steroids and immunotherapy at the same time. Um, but generally speaking, other, other types of medications that patients will commonly be taking, for example, painkillers or anti-sickness medication, there shouldn't be any problem with the, with the giving those at the same time as giving the immunotherapy. Okay, and then um, sort of along those lines as well, are there any dangers to be aware of or um you know really bad side effects so the, the side effects are really what i spoke about just a wee bit earlier and just with respect to the um most of the side effects tend to be in the acute phase and what we mean by that is most of the side effects tend to occur around the administration of the drug and um, there is there are some problems reported with longer term side effects whereby patients can have autoimmune effects which is where the immune system it targets the body itself rather than the tumor um, and that can that can involve problems with thyroid hormones and problems with the pancreas 
Um, but again, that's something that we would monitor the patients for and be able to act upon if, we, if, that, if that had occurred. Okay, thank you. Um, Claire, going back to your slide, your first slide earlier, um, can you just expand a bit more on how the doctor gets the tills out of a patient's tumour um, and then how you grow them before you give them back to the patient and, and then really how people receive this um, immunotherapy, is it by IV or by direct injection? So can you just delve a bit further into the process, yeah. please? And, and a follow-up question on that, on that also, is it an approach unique for patients as well? So it is, I'll, I'll go to the, that question first. So it is unique per patient. Um, they say it is basically a personalized medicine because each therapy is based on the person's own tumor and how it's isolated. So this tumor itself and the cells from that are designed to target within that single, that patient themselves if that makes sense. Um, so how, this is just a schematic of how we actually, how it's actually done um, clinically. So, so patients that are candidates for TIL therapy, they basically, they require a surgery um, in which all or a portion of the tumor is removed. So what we do then in the lab is we basically, we fragment it and then it goes for initial expansion. So we grow it, what we call in, in, in vitro, so in cell culture. And this initial expansion just basically is to grow the tills. At that point, we can freeze them down and cryopreserve them so that they're reserved for later if we need to. And then they're grown in this rapid expansion protocol. So this is to grow them in very large numbers and they're grown together with basic with these these things that will help them so a cytok a, um, so IL2 and um, CD3 and these irradiated feeder cells which are feeder these are cells that we irradiate that are from the patient's blood and these help the the, the tills develop so these irradiated feeder cells don't actually um, grow them um, proliferate themselves they're just there as supporting cells so once we've successfully grown um, all of these cells, so there's millions and millions of them, and they are, you know, they pass all of their QC analysis, they're then infused back into the patient. So when they're infused um, back into the patient, they actively attack cancer cells and they leave healthy cells alone. And just before this, there's a brief course of chemotherapy required prior to till infusion, and that's to help the tills attack the tumor. Oh, I've gone too far. Was that okay? Was did you yeah. want to go back to it? That slide. Um, that I okay? might. I might do just if See some. If you can find it. I've got a question for Carl in the meantime. Um, if you want to try and find that, Claire. Um, how many times did a patient need to be treated to see an effect? So how quickly could? We start to see results on our next MRI scan, for example. Yeah, so you would anticipate an immediate effect with this um, with this treatment. Um, so if the, if the treatment were to work, it is something that would work that would work reasonably quickly in the weeks and months following the treatment. Um, but I suppose it's maybe just worth emphasising that prior to giving it to patients, we have to make sure that it works in the lab first of all, if you know what I mean. So we would um, we would use um, plan these experiments as Claire has described. And that will give us then the evidence to go ahead and to um, and to seek approval to use this in patients afterwards. And um, so we, we need to gather the preclinical evidence, which is what this this diagram really nicely summarizes before we would go ahead and then give it to patients with NF2 afterwards. OK, you mentioned earlier, actually, about having perhaps um, some chemotherapy beforehand. Is there, are there any other medications that would need to be taken at the same time to receive the TILs? So the, the chemotherapy is given beforehand. Yeah, as I mentioned, it's a short course um, when they've been given for melanoma and ovarian cancer. So you would take a short course of seven days of chemotherapy. And then afterwards, um, if you look down at the very bottom beside G on Claire's slide, you can see that there's this drug called IL-2. Um, and you should think of IL-2 as like a, a growth factor for the T cells. So IL-2 is a protein that occurs naturally in the body and it helps these T cells to function as best as possible. And that's normally given um, as a <clears throat> excuse me, and that's normally given as a fourteen day course of uh, of injections after the 
after the till infusion um, just to um, really give those T-cells a boost to make sure that they're working correctly um, and as they're going to be as efficacious against the tumour as possible. Yeah, okay, thank you. Claire, did you want to continue with your presentation? I just have, I have an, another slide, which will probably be the actual, our actual experimental work, which is the next slide. Okay, so should we, should we get onto that now? So, um, yeah. so what, so what does the NF2 uh, TEAL project want to accomplish and what will be the next steps after this project? So what, what do we want to achieve here? And then where do we take it from, mm -hmm. from here? So this is just a brief experimental outline of, of what we're proposing to do. So this is basically the first hurdle in determining if till therapy could be beneficial. So what, what the most important thing from these set of experiments is we need to know if we can isolate the tills, if we, could, if we can successfully grow them, and will they kill tumor cells? So this is the, the planned experiment is that basically I'll be in the lab and I'll receive a tumor sample. And then the, cell, the tumor will be associated into many, many cells. Um, from then I'll expand the cells. So I'll expand the cells with IL2 and CD3. So these will help, these help tills to develop, to, to grow. These are growth factors that will help tills to grow. And then assess them on flow cytometry. So flow cytometry is a type of way that we can look at what the different cell populations within a, a particular experiment. Um, so the first thing we'll look at, we're going to look at what different cell types. So we want to make sure that we have predominantly T cells. We'll also look at the number of B cells and NK cells. We'll also then look at other markers. So markers to look for T cell activation, functionality and exhaustion. And um, so hopefully we should get, so we, have an, we do have a, a whole battery of, um, of, of markers that we want to see. And, there, and if we have them, then we're, that's what we want to see. And um, at the same time, we're going to initiate these primary cell cultures. So these are from the same patient and we're going to derive them into tumor lines or just grow them as primary cell cultures. These cell cultures, what we're going to do is co-culture them with our tills. So co-culturing means growing them together. And these experiments will help us determine if our tills have the ability to kill cancer cells. Um, and then we'll run, we have some experiments in the lab um, using these plate-based assays. So these kind of, um, these kind of plates looking at um, cytokine release and cell death, and they'll help us assess tumor killing properties. So this is the first set of experiments that we want to do. So if we have that, if we can prove we have T cells that are functional and that can kill cancer cells, we will go to, our, the plan is that we will go to the regulators here so the regulators here um, will help us with our next help us in the planning of our next set of experiments and they'll be able to tell us what the experiments we need to do are to get into clinic so if there's any kind of preclinical animal work that needs doing um, the kind of safety experiments and that would be um, that's the follow-on from this uh, Claire, we have a question from a viewer. Mm -hmm. um, he's asking, what is the timeline for this preclinical research? Well, maybe the, the, we're, we've anticipated it's about two years of work. Two years. That's, that includes that, this step and that step afterward? Just this, just this step. Just this step. Okay. Just this step. The, the step afterwards, that also, the length of time can also be when we speak to our, our regulators, so the, um, the MHRA here, they usually tell you the length of time that you might need to use it, run these experiments for, whether it's a 60 day experiment, a 90 day experiment, especially when you're doing it kind of like um, animal safety studies. So, so they'll help us with that kind of experimental design. And, and another question from our viewer, how many patients will you recruit into this trial in order to get these tumor samples? So this initial, these initial experiments, we were looking to get 20 in the two years. So four schwannomas, four meningiomas, and um, one to two ependymomas, and that's per year. And this is based on the, the number that we can get that are operated on. 
and that we would be able to get consented and, and, and tumours and it viable cells. And that's what we estimate. And another question that's for myself, just thinking about it, will you freeze the cells of these people that are part of the trial in case it might work and later after a year or two, you might, once you move to the next step, you might inject back these cells. So these, these there will be cells frozen at this rapid um, expansion phase. These cells though won't be able to be put into a person because they won't be made. There's a special manufacturing process that you need for cell therapy. Mm. So they need to be basically made in a clean room as opposed to just the lab environment. And they need to reach a standard which we call good manufacturing practice. Um, GM, oh, GMP production. Um, and we, um, we, we don't have that. That's a long process and an expensive process. And you can't really do that until you have this initial experiments, these initial kind of um, proof of concept experiments done. Okay, thank you. We have more questions from the from the, the public here, from the viewer, but uh, I let you, Claire, continue. And after that, we can come back to the questions from the viewer. Yeah, I think we can probably go to the questions now. I just wondered if Omar wanted to add anything at this point. Yeah, I think I think just to say that, that this is really um, at the front and centre of truly personalised, um, individualised care for patients. As Claire described, it's it's taking an immune response which exists in patients' own tumours and then helping it to be effective and bolstering it up and putting it back to treat the tumour. And it's probably the case that many NF2 patients are continuously forming tumours that we never actually see or don't continue to grow. We know there's a wide spectrum of how tumours progress um, in, in patients with NF2. And that's at least in part because some of those tumors have got a very effective immune process going on and for whatever reason in some tumors there's a breakaway from that normal body reaction which allows it to control these tumors growing and so what we're really trying to do is to re-establish an effective way for the body's own cells to deal with tumors which we know that it's probably doing effectively all the time anyway in the background and we're just helping it to, to reaffirm itself and work in that way um, Nothing's without side effects. We've talked about some of those things. You know, there's always a potential cost with these things. But, uh, but the great thing here is that if we if we can re-educate the immune system, if we can combine it perhaps with uh, with, with some of the other treatments that that uh, are coming along as well, then actually this may be a long-lasting treatment for for patients as well. Yeah, it's very exciting, isn't it, to think that the body can then just wake up and start helping itself again. Um, so can you give us any idea on how well this is working in cancer patients at the moment? So it's still, it's still being used um, in trials as opposed to sort of routine use in, in patients in, in, in everyday clinics uh, at the moment. But we do know that for some patients, and it's not for all, but for some patients, you get a really spectacular result. Um, and the work is still ongoing as to what differentiates patients who have a really good response from those who don't and so on. And, and there will be tweaks and changes that come along the way to improve that with time. But I think it's important that we don't overstate um, what we can extrapolate from cancer, because we know these are different types of tumours. You know, these are by and large benign types of tumours, although very serious, benign by pathology, but often malignant by location, I say, because of the effect that they have. Um, we shouldn't overstate what we can learn from other cancers. We can be excited by what we see, but we need to go now and, and prove that this is a valid option for patients with NF2. And if we can show that it is a valid option in the experiments that Claire has described, then we can take that to our uh, healthcare regulation. We can ask them to guide us, as Claire said, what's the minimum safe steps that we can next take to get this to patients? Um, so, so I think that's, that's, that's where we are. We're excited by it. We see some really good results in patients with cancer. Um, and we, want to, we desperately want to see whether or not this can work for patients with NF2 so important to try isn't it and that's what we need to fundraise for and and get this opportunity for nf2 off the ground 
So um, what's the eligibility criteria? So would you have to start with adults or, you know, would you be, you probably won't be starting with children, I, I wouldn't imagine. So, so in terms of the preclinical work, um, we, we will probably do it in, in adult patients. In terms of the clinical work, again, it's likely to be done in, in adults first. Um, but in time, we would, we would anticipate being able to extend this. Now, there are going to be some interesting questions about the timing of employing this type of treatment, because we're not going to want to employ it too early. Uh, we're not going to want to employ it too late. It's going to be finding that sweet spot where we can minimize any harm from growing tumors, but also make sure that we have the maximum effect on tumors that are going to appear. So if a child has got NF2 and has developed a number of tumors, but they can tolerate growth then perhaps for another decade or so before they're likely to need treatment, then it's likely to be better that we wait a bit in order for them to develop any other tumours that they might be about to develop so that we can knock those potentially on the head with any treatment as well at the same time. And for, for, uh, for, your, for a question on that, for the other disease, um, is it a series of treatment for melanoma and ovarian? Ten, ten, tends, to, t tends to be uh, the, the one-off treatment. So you have this, this cycle of treatment where you get your preconditioning regime, uh, then you get your adoptive cell therapy with the TIL, um, with, with the, the lymphocytes. Um, and then you see now, of course, again, we have a difference in NF2 in that this is a chronic condition. It's not uh, a, a, a cancer with a limited life expectancy like some of the other cancers have, have been treated. Um, and even those cases where patients have been effectively cured or are in remission for a long time, a long time is not the same as a long time in NF2 because they've not, they've not been in use for, for, for that long. And so the long-term durability of treatment is, again, something that will, will have to be determined with time. And it may be in NF2 if the immune system is not fully educated, if you like, with a single treatment or it slips and, it, and, and, and ceases to be effective down the years that we might need to institute some form of, of, of additional therapy, but it might not be the full sequence again, it might be something which, which tweaks that response, or it may be a full repeat of, of what was done before. Thank you. Um, what options um, do you have for people that are unable to provide actual tumor samples? Um, so I think in terms of, in terms of not being able to treat, uh, provide tumor samples, I guess, we're talking about people who are too unwell potentially to to undergo the treatment so, uh, or you know if if they're well enough most patients with nf2 who would need the treatment would have a tumor that could be sampled for this um we'd have to use a different form of therapy if for some reason that there was a limited spectrum of tumors in an individual patient that were all felt to be too high risk for some reason um, there probably need to be a different approach than with TILS because we need the tumour um, in order to harness the immune cells that are already trying to do their work in those tumours. The location of tumours isn't necessarily a problem. So I think going back to the, to, to the point raised again earlier, the only main difference is where they exist in that normal barrier between our blood and our brain or our spinal cord. And so it will just have to be shown over time whether or not the same treatment can be effective on an ependymoma within the spinal cord as a tumour on a nerve uh, or as a tumour on the meninges uh, line in the brain. And there might be a difference and there might need to be uh, a different approach potentially to how we um, precondition what, what we're using beforehand, but also potentially in terms of other treatments which can open that blood-brain barrier, either temporarily or, or uh, for, for, for the period during the treatment. Yeah, thank you. Jill, can you see some other questions? Yes. Um, if, if an NF2 tumour isn't hot, that's a question from Margaret. So if a tumour is not hot, having a lot of teals, can it be turned into a hot tumour? Um, 
So uh, in terms of hot, we refer to hot often in terms of its immune reaction as well. So a hot tumor is one that's got lots of uh, inflammation within it and a, and a strong yeah. immune reaction going on. Um, it might not be the type of immune reaction that we want. It might be a, a type of reaction which is actually promoting some growth. And that's uh, a piece of work that's, that's going on. And we're looking at other uh, potential inflammatory factors and pathways that we can target in that um, uh, vicinity. So the question I suppose there is, if we start tinkering with the immune system, can it go the wrong way? Yeah. Uh, and and, and can, can we make a, a tumour that, that's not? I suppose the main risk is that there could be some initial swelling when the T cells get in and start to form a immune reaction against the tumour. It's possible that there could be some swelling and that then will lead to careful decision making in our selection of the, certainly the, the early patients that might be suitable for this treatment because we wouldn't want to select people uh, who might suffer from the consequences of a small amount of swelling within their tumour in the early in the early phases. I think it's unlikely that, that, that this treatment is, is, is going to sort of flick a switch and cause the tumors to uh, continuously keep growing uh, more than they otherwise would have done. That, that I think is unlikely, um, but it's possible that we could cause some short-term swelling. Thank you. Another question is, do the patients have to be in UK to be selected for tumor biopsy? What about international patients for the preclinical uh, work? Uh, I think I think at the moment, in terms of keeping the the costs efficient um, and and at a sort of reasonable level to allow us to do this work um, uh, without it breaking the bank, then it's likely that we will will initially do it um, through patients coming through the centre in Manchester, and we have as you know, a large centre in Manchester. So we, we, we are able to, um, to collect that tissue. Now, if we were to be able to secure further funding, it's possible that we could open the, um, the recruitment out wider. Um, but, uh, but obviously there's a balance to be had between doing this efficiently um, with as minimal regulatory hurdles um, and reducing the costs so that we can get the results as quickly as possible. And really, the phase at where there might be a benefit to, to um, the NF2 community to having a wider um, recruitment uh, um, perimeter would be at the stage of getting this out to clinical trials. Um, and I think at that point, um, there would be a, a much sort of uh, much more thought given to, to, to opening it out wider in terms of the recruitment, although there will still be additional hurdles and, and, you know, the costs, unfortunately, of running the clinical trials when we bring this to patients are, are very high, uh, at least initially. Um, and, and again, there will need to be consideration given to that because we want to balance getting the results quickly and efficiently at high quality so that we know the answers so we can get it out to people if it does work uh, with being as inclusive as possible from the outset. Yeah. And you said earlier that you mentioned the timing, not too early or not too late. What, what do you mean by not too late? Well, I think, I think what we don't want to do is to um, wait until patients have no other options at all and perhaps have very severe disease and may have deteriorated to the point where um, their, their general health uh, is not good and they're, um, and they're frail because what we don't want to do is provide results which show that it's not effective, which is not actually the real result. That's just a reflection of the fact that the patients were unwell um, when they went into this. And so we don't want to, to, to sort of pull the trigger on what is still a major, a major undertaking in terms of this treatment too early. We want to balance that, minimize the number of treatments a patient has over their lifetime, minimize the amount of, of um, morbidity or any other risk that can happen with any treatment. But at the same time, we, we want to very carefully select people before they get to the stage where um, they're too frail to safely undergo this and to have the maximal chance of their body mounting this fight against the tumors. And another question. Um, also about the um, side effect is uh, if, if the tumor is, for example, a vestibular schwannoma tumor and, uh, and the cells attack it, could it 
deteriorate, damage the hearing somehow, maybe a temporary, or can it even damage the nerve itself? So there, there, there is a possibility that by turning the immune system more effectively against the tumor, that the inflammation that it produces uh, could have a, a knock-on effect on the, on the function of the nerve that the tumor is involved with. That, that, that is a possibility. Um, uh, but again, it's, it's something that we would need to, to, to assess um, by trying it, because all treatments, whether it's surgery, uh, or any other form of, of treatment have potential unwanted side effects. Um, and again, probably the size of the tumor may have an effect there and whether or not it's already causing problems. So in somebody who has already got significant hearing loss, for instance, I would think that the chances of having a, um, a bad effect on the remaining hearing would be higher uh, than somebody who had good hearing to start with and so on. And that's the case also for surgery that tries to preserve hearing, for instance. And we're already working with you, looking at repurposing existing drugs to reduce inflammation um, in vestibular schwannomas and meningiomas. And we have patients on Avastan and, and um, other drugs for NF2. So I'm sure people are thinking, you know, well, once we create the, um, you know, the uh, repurpose drugs to reduce inflammation, you know, I'll be on that or I'll be on Avastan. So, you know, can I do immunotherapy at the same time? So I think I think we would probably in the first instance not combine some of the anti-inflammatory drugs with this treatment, but it may be that those become very useful um, either after the initial treatment in order to modulate the response or to dampen down any unwanted effects from the inflammation, for instance. Um, in terms of Avastin, it, it's possible that there may be an additive effect, but it's again more complicated to predict by the fact that if you reduce the blood flow into a tumour, then potentially you also reduce the distribution of cells uh, that you're introducing into the patient. So again, in the first stages, I would anticipate that we would not combine those two treatments, although the, it's likely that any patient that was previously on Avastin, if they wanted to, would be able to go back on it after a period of time. I think it would be wonderful to have options for people with NF2, and that's what we're looking at at the moment, isn't it? Options. Exactly. A question from Joanne is then, um, how quickly do you expect the teal to work on the tumor? Is it a question of days, weeks, months? Let's say once the teal is uh, attacking the tumor, how long it takes for the tumor to decrease of, uh, of style to see a response? So uh, again, I think I think we're stra we'd probably be straying slightly into the into the guesstimate territory um, if we were to describe a time course for. The, the tumors we see in, in, in NF2, because we just don't know. We don't know until we try it, what happens in meningioma, schwannoma, ependymoma. Um, what I would say is that we would, affect, we would expect, as Gahal said, that if it was going to have an effect at the cellular level to get into the tumor and start doing some of its work, that it would start doing that pretty quickly. Um, and that that work um, that, that those cells would be doing to try and uh, halt or even eradicate some of the tumor cells in, in their growth um, will start pretty quickly and will start to have an effect. Now, I did say that the, the slight caveat to that is that they might it might cause a bit of swelling uh, up front uh, before it starts to go down. Actually, is exactly what we see with radio surgery, for instance, where often patients who are treated with radio surgery, we see growth, what we think is growth, it's swelling of the tumor before it starts to um, take take control. And um, on that, Omar, um, radiation therapy is, as you say, common with NF2 with the vestibular schwannomas. So, um, would you would would the TIL therapy still work on tumours that were treated by radiation therapy, or would you want tumours that um, that weren't weren't touched as such? Margaret Reynolds is asking that question. Um, I, I I think that uh, you know. At this point in time, I don't see any reason why we would exclude patients with tumours that have been treated by radiotherapy in the past. We would not envisage doing a combination trial 
as the first thing. You always try to start simple and see what the effect is with the most simple and safe approaches before you start combining things. And then it's difficult to pull out what's having what effect. So I don't think we would be doing a early combination trial of radiotherapy together with the TIL therapy. But I think that in patients who may have had um, a breakthrough of their tumor that's continued to grow after treatment with radiotherapy in the past, um, that, that it would still be possible to do TIL therapy as a salvage therapy. Okay, um, I think we've covered most of the questions that have come in. Uh, if you've got another question, we've probably got time for one or two more. If you want to quickly pop that in the chat. Um, but I think we've covered everything that we hope to cover in this hour. It's been really, really informative. So thank you all very, very much. Um, Jill, I'm not sure. I think I think we've really covered a lot, <laughs> yeah. and um, I can't see any more questions coming in. So um, I think we should probably just say thank you very much um, to Claire, Omar, and Carl for their time um, and um, for you know such wonderful information. Thank you, thank you. We're seeing lots of thank yous coming in. Um, and Gilles, if I pass back over to you just to sign off, if you have any words that you want to just close yeah. off with. Yes, thank you. So um, again, we, we would like to launch this research. Uh, uh, as you see, it's, uh, it's not a, um, a quick research. We, 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 it takes many years. It takes, we take at least two years for this preclinical research. Uh, every research uh, takes time. And uh, I know as a a dad of, the, of uh, a kid with NF2, we need an answer now, but we have to start from somewhere. We have to jumpstart all these different approach in parallel. So, at, so we know that in a few years from now, we will have different options and we can start them only with your help, uh, only with your support. The best that we can do as patients is to jumpstart this preclinical research. When, once it is started, once there is results, then the labs will find, will find ways to raise more money. The, harder, the hardest part for the labs is to start, and that's where we help them. So please, if you can uh, um, donate today and during the next few weeks so we can jumpstart this research, and, uh, and then we as an F2B solution after that, we monitor the progress, we make sure it's progressing, we are sharing updates, and making sure you, we, you stay in the loop. So thank you very much. And let's see if you can take a, a few seconds to, to answer to the feedback, the poll that is on your screen. And uh, thanks again, and uh, back to you, Claire. Yeah, I think that's it. It's just, it's just now to um, say, please complete that poll. The um, donate button is in the chat there if you'd like to support this project. So um, please um, help us to help ourselves. And thank you all very much for joining. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much for having us. Thank you.